are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundaram and with my co-host, Ashley Kays, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Myri Morrison. Myri Morrison originally started her working life as a graphic designer, moving to bid and proposal management 18 years ago. She's an all-rounder in the profession with an excellent track record of proposal management winning multi-million global bids for corporate companies, bid writing, helping clients focus their words on the customer as well as successfully hitting the dreaded word and character count and bid strategy. She's worked across most sectors in the UK and the US and worked on specific deals in Greece, Kuwait, Norway and South Africa. Having worked away up the ranks from a small company to corporate life She now works for strategic proposals. Myri's been a member of APMP since 2014 and won the Bid Excellence Award in 2015 APMP UK. Holding APMP professional certification, Myri now also sits on the APMP UK board as marketing and communications director. She's also actively engaged in thought leadership, publishing her research paper on mental health and well-being in the bid and proposal profession in May 2020. as well as being an advocate for nurturing good health mental health in our profession she's also a crisis volunteer outside of work to help those in need myri has also presented at the apmp uk annual conference and the us northeasters conference in 2017 welcome myri to scribble talk thank you So Mary, we love to start in the beginning. So we're curious, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Okay. So, um at the moment I live just outside London, but I was born in a small fishing town in the northeast of Scotland. Um so the town is 20,000 people, so it's quite small. Um if you want to go to the cinema, it's a 2-hour round trip. Ooh. Um, <laughs> which is quite hard. Uh So but it has the most gorgeous sandy beach it goes on for miles. Mm-hmm. Um so I was born in that town brought up in that town I had a uh a little period of time on the west coast of Scotland uh, as a child which was great. Um but then returned back to north east Scotland uh went to school there grew up there that was my little corner of Scotland really. <laughs> Wow, it sounds beautiful. Yeah, the beach and everything's beautiful, but it's right on the corner of the North Sea, so it's very cold. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so in our intro, we kind of learned that you started out in graphic design and in that arena. Was that your first job outside of school or um what was your first job? Um my first job um i had various jobs while i was at school uh mm-hmm. so for example delivering newspapers uh worked in a, a kind of cafe i worked in a fish factory as well oh wow um, <laughs> which is a bit seems a bit weird when i say it but because i grew up in a fishing town that was mm-hmm. one of the main industries so if yeah. you wanted work um while you were at school to make some money you would go to the fish factory and you would pack fish you would gut fish um and it was good money while you were at school so um yeah. the the smell wasn't great <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah it was a good money earner that so i can gut fish and everything <laughs> um oh, so those my were my those were my first jobs while I was at school and then i went to uh college uh studied art and graphic design um went into things like photography and stuff um and that's where I was always creative and arty so that's where my first job then came in as a graphic designer and I didn't come across, across bidding proposals till much later on oh okay so when did you uh enter the proposal field um it was back in 2002 um okay. another part of my education had been that while I was a graphic designer I went and studied at the Open University and did a degree in English language and literature mm. um just as a kind of side thing that I was doing. So 
moving forward to 2002, I basically had, I quit my design job and I'd just been on a three month road trip across the US and back Ooh. again. I went all the way across the Southern states up through Arizona, California, and then, oh, all, wow. the, and then all the way back to the East Coast again. Um, <laughs> And um, so I just done that, came back and decided I just wanted a change of job. Um, I did love doing graphic design, but I wanted to keep my creativity for outside of work instead of mm -hmm. channeling all my creativity into a customer's brief. I, yeah. I felt like I couldn't be as creative as what I wanted to be and do the things that mm -hmm. I really wanted to do creatively. So I thought I would like to use my English degree for something. So what happened was I got the local newspaper, which is tiny, never has any jobs in it apart from <laughs> maybe cleaning jobs or, you know, that type of thing. And I looked in it and there was a job advert for a bid and proposal coordinator. And I had no idea what this was, but they wanted, <laughs> they wanted somebody with an English degree. So I thought I might as well apply for it and I got yeah. the job. So that's how I started off in proposals. Um, from there, the, the company I worked for actually took in a, a bid manager at the same time. And six months later, I took his job. So um, oh. and then that just set me on that course and I, I just loved it. So kept going. Oh my it. goodness. Yeah. Wow. I haven't heard of anybody looking in a newspaper in so long. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> sure. um, so from there, it sounds like you've really just progressed within the field and got to um, work on some amazing projects. Are there any proposal efforts that stand out to you? Um, I think there's quite a few. I've done loads and loads, hundreds of proposals. Um, I think I do have some memorable ones, but probably for different reasons. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've worked on proposals in Kuwait, South Africa, Greece. Those were memorable because one, I had to fly to a different country and work out there, but it also brought forward my love of writing as well. Um, we'd work with a company, we'd have a, like a joint venture with a company in that country that we were bidding with, but I would go out and take what they'd written and write it in British English because we were finding that when Greek people or Kuwaiti people were writing these bids, how they wrote it in their English, sometimes it it, it gave across a different message. It was a wrong message. So mm -hmm. I was tasked with going out, reworking it all in British English and, and having the team there that had originally written it so that I could question them about various bits to make sure that our message was exactly what we wanted it to say in the right context. Right. So, oh, wow. So those ones were memorable for those. Uh, another memorable one <laughs> for a bad reason, was one <laughs> where I worked 29 hours straight through. Wow. Um, then I had to package it up, straight into a taxi for four hours, then mm. spent two hours sleeping in a hotel, then I had to deliver the bid and then get a train back home. So that was a memory oh. that I really don't want to remember that one. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah, I think we all have that one that stands Ooh. out for the wrong reason. <laughs> um, so over the years, you have accomplished so much within the field. Can you highlight a few of the achievements you're most proud of? Um, I think my main achievement is getting this far in the industry. So I now mm. work for strategic proposals who are very well thought of. Um, great thought leadership. There's a lot of experience in that team. Um, they're very picky about who they who they have in that team. Um, and so to get to this stage, I'm very proud of. I mm -hmm. feel that since 2002, it does look like I've achieved a lot in my career, but I feel that I've had to fight every step of the way. Um, oh. 
you know, I've I've worked hard on bids. I've worked in in companies that have had big sales teams with very um, big personalities, so that mm-hmm. um, you know to try and tame those personalities to get them to do what you want is is quite hard. I've mm-hmm. worked in companies where it's been very male dominated, which has been uh, quite difficult to deal with, you know, not so much now, but back when I started. Um, mm-hmm. And at one point I was told that I shouldn't be a bid manager at all. Oh, <laughs> so, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so thankfully I didn't listen to that and carried on. Um, right. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's not always been plain sailing. So I think my biggest achievement is, is being where I am at now um, mm, and doing totally. what I do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's not always an easy path, right? And we have to fight and work hard. And it sounds yeah. like you've dealt with some challenges in a very positive way and pushed through it. And that's why you're where you are now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so before we move on and dig a little bit more into APMP and a little bit more into your career in depth, um, can you tell us three things that not many people know about you? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the first one is I'm terrified of dogs, oh. um, <laughs> which is a bit of a weird one. I've never been bitten by a dog. I actually, I actually like dogs. And um, we actually had a couple of puppies while I was growing up. So I don't know where it's come from, but it's always been with me. Terrified mm. of dogs completely. Um, and I don't think it's anything that's going to go away. Um, I get to the point where when I see a dog, I will have a panic attack. I've been physically sick when I've seen a dog. It, it gets really bad. Um, but I found I am, it, it's kind of mellowed a little bit. With lockdown, I've been doing a lot of walking. So I walk <laughs> around the local park. And, um, and I usually, on my mobile phone, I log it in the Strava application. So, <laughs> yeah you can yeah. record your walks and get the details and everything so a lot of my Strava walks you can see this map that goes a bit funny sometimes because <laughs> I'll come across a dog and then I'll have to double back and then wait and then go back <laughs> that way so um yeah so it's never like a complete loop I always double back and stuff because there's dogs there. so, <laughs> yeah so that's one another thing um This is going to sound really dodgy, but it's not. So I draw nude people. (laughs) So Mm. when I say that, people go, Um, (laughs) but this comes back to my, my days of drawing and painting, going to art school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I still draw a lot outside work. I sell my work. And my favorite type of drawing is to actually go to like a workshop on a Saturday where you get a life model and you draw them um so that's where I go and draw naked people (laughs) oh wow and then the third one I had trouble thinking of I probably have heaps that I couldn't think um I'm (laughs) I'm a member of Mensa um oh wow which I keep very secret because I I really don't like kind of promote myself in a good light really um so I'm a member of Meta I've always I learned to read when I was three years old um so I've had a love of books since I was three um and my mind's always been quite quick so I did the Mm -hmm. um initial testing and then I got invited to do the full-on testing which takes hours and um so my IQs in the top one percent of the population um but the thing is iq isn't a measurement of how clever you are it's actually a measurement of how quick your brain works Mm. um and so my brain works really quickly which was a bad side of it as well in that i get bored very quickly Mm. my mind has to be constantly occupied which is why I love working on on bids because you get really busy and and your head's crammed with stuff um so yeah oh my goodness (laughs) such a fascinating person (laughs) Myrie perfect so uh 
thank you, Mary. That's uh, amazing. I'm so looking forward to round three. Let's cut to round two. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's jump. laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, I'm sorry, APMP guys. We will continue with APMP, but then we have a most exciting talk. Yeah. So, um, um, you did mention strategic proposals, uh, Mary, after a successful career at Canon and previously with, uh, with the other companies. Uh, when did you meet John and Graham, and do you have any memorable experience of uh, how were you recruited and your first? Big or first project with strategic proposal? Yeah, it was. I've always, uh, since I met John, which was in probably early, end of 2013 or beginning of 2014, and I, I had started work at Canon. I'd never heard of the APMP, <laughs> which is not mm. very good, <laughs> but um, John came in to do some training with a big team, and that's how I met John. He, he was the guy that trained me and the, to pass the foundation and, and practitioner exams which i did that year so in 2014 i i did uh, foundation and practitioner um and then john was always in the background he'd always keep in touch um i'd sometimes reach out if i needed support on something or had a question um john is great he's so passionate about what he does and that really struck a chord in me i've always been passionate about bids and proposals and i it's one thing that i really like seeing in other people it doesn't need to be about bid and proposals but they you know it really they really stick in my mind if they're passionate about something and i like seeing that passion you know their eyes light up they they want to talk about it and they get really excited so john's that type of person so um I always kept in touch with John um, and then uh, you know joined the APMP there was a conference where I won an award which I'll probably come to later um, so John was one of the first to congratulate me so we just kept in touch and then I left Canon in 2018 end of 2018 and I was just figuring out what I was going to do next and then John heard that I had left Canon and he phoned me up and asked if I would come and work at SP, um, which just totally excited me because on my career path, I'd always looked up to John. I'd always looked up to SP as thought leaders and they're at the top of their game. And, and in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, when I've got all the experience I can get, I would love to work for SP, but I didn't think it would come at this stage. I thought, I was still quite a few years away from um, even trying to get into SP, but um, John came chasing me, so I was quite happy to get involved with them. Um, and it was the best decision I've made. I love working at SP. Um, we're like one big family. Um, you know, we often work on our projects on our own, but we join up with them. Uh, with other people in the team to do a team effort we come together a couple of times a year in person which hasn't obviously happened at the moment um but we have afternoon tea and calls and stuff and yeah it's just like being part of one big family and it's great oh, And you did mention you joined APMP uh, after Canon, or uh, I do remember, was it 2015, Mayuri, that you won the APMP yeah, uh, so award? I think I joined APMP in 2014, mm. as I um, did my foundation in practitioner. And then 2015, I won the Bid Excellence Award, um, which I was very surprised to win. And I didn't even really know about the awards, but I was... Mm sitting with the Canon UK bid team uh, one day and they, they were talking about the awards and we should go for awards. So they were trying to work out who should go for what award. And somebody suggested that um, I should go for an award because I'd just done a, a huge project that was very successful and um, a different way of working than we had worked before. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll put in a... a application for that and then I got really competitive about it I really wanted to win it and I didn't think I would so they have mm -hmm. a short list so I they advised me of the date they were going to make the short list 
and then that date came it passed and I was like mm. oh. and I got really impatient I thought I have an error and by this time I was like really determined that you know I want to win a, an award and um so I got in touch with them quite a few times so they probably didn't like me at this stage um <laughs> to see and they, they kept delaying the shortlist probably because they were just really busy now that I'm on the board I I realize how busy these people are mm. and um so there was one day I had to drive from the Canon Europe office in Oxbridge to the Canon UK office. So I got in my car, I was driving, switched my phone off because, I, you know, you can't use it driving. When I switched it back on, I had about 30 emails. I'm like, what's going on? And they announced the shortlist while I was driving in my car. So I was the last one to know that I made the shortlist after mm -hmm. waiting all this time for it so yeah I went on to win it I think I was up against uh, a team from Verizon and a team from Vodafone and, um, yeah so I won that award yes I vividly remember the time because that was my first APMP UK conference oh, was it? <laughs> <laughs> yes I think uh, I think Tony Birch gave you the award I think that's right yeah yeah, yeah. I remember I was sitting with Tony and, oh, uh, I still have a video of it somewhere. <laughs> yes, that's an amazing memory there. So from uh, from being an award recipient, from being a member to winning the award to now being part of the board, how was your UK board experience coming along? Do you have any interesting uh, experience so far, memorable memories yeah. with your colleagues? Yes, yeah, so um, I joined in December as marketing and comms director. Mm -hmm. um, it's busy. <laughs> We've met a couple of times as a board before we obviously went into lockdown and can't meet each other. Everything we do is is uh, virtual at the moment. Um, but I knew quite a few of the board before. Um, but I've really enjoyed getting to know them as a team. The, we work really well as a team. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really busy at the minute. We've got quite a few initiatives on the go. There's, you know, we're a team that have a lot of ideas and a lot of very good ideas, which then mm. means that we have to, you know, work through those ideas. And, and, um, but I think it's a very good team at the moment. We're very focused on the benefit we give to members. And I think the members are beginning to see that, that, you know, it's all about the members and what we can give them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've loved being on board. It is very busy um you know and we do our board meetings on a saturday so um, <laughs> <laughs> um but it's great it's great and i feel that i'm giving something back to the membership as well um which they've helped me gain certification so i wanted to give something back which is why i went for a board position perfect mary so uh uh the new APMP initiatives, Myri, you know, the online community and also uh, the online conference and stuff. How are we gearing up for the new initiatives at the back of the successful APMP uh, winning business virtual experience? Yeah, we're um, so we've launched quite a few things. Um, mm -hmm. I think the one that's on everybody's minds at the moment is BidX, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I've had quite a few people come to me and say, what's this about? What, what are you doing? But mm. um, no, you just have to wait and see what happens with that one. Um, you know, we will be announcing things as we, we go through the next month or so. Um, but it's definitely worth um, putting. We've now put the date out. So it's definitely worth putting yes. that in your diary because um, it's going to be completely different and just amazing. Um, the online community we launched that so that's still in its infancy so we still want members to sign up for it to have a look around there's groups on there that can provide support you've got a well-being group that i'm in charge of there's a membership group there's various other things there's uh you know research groups etc um and then it's just like as somebody said it, it's like the facebook for bids and I found mm. when I first joined it, because we kind of played around with it before we launched it just to make sure it worked and stuff. And I got, it was like in the, the early days of Facebook, you, you tend to be on it all the time. Mm. So, uh, but um, yeah, we still need some more people so that we can get more conversations going. 
and it's going to be a really good resource just for you know it's different from linkedin and linkedin you you get things about bids and proposals you get things about various sectors and, and just people you know whereas this filters everything out so it's just bid and proposal things and you can check on there when our events are on um, there's polls there's discussions um, it's worth getting involved in and then another initiative we launched recently was the redundancy support program in the career clinic so obviously a lot of people in our industry were put on furlough or made yeah. redundant or maybe are still at risk of redundancy mm. so we decided to put out to support the members and support them by um giving support to those who need it and helping them so whether it's through coaching or if it if they want their how they should write their cv or if they just want somebody to talk to or if they want mentoring or you know there's a various different things and this is all free to members so if mm. people are having these type of issues where they need support they can come to the apmp and get that free at the moment so wow that's that's very very great initiatives especially at the very right time i as you know the more and more we are heading to October when mm -hmm. most of the furlough period finishes. Yeah. Um, you know, we are going to see more people doing this, so more people and anxiety. That's, yeah. um, that's great. Having said that, um, Mary, you have been a big, big, big advocate on mental health awareness in our community. Um, you know, what uh, initiated that um, um, drive and uh, any memorable experiences or anything you want to share to the community? Yeah, I think this is really important for everybody in the community. And I think it's important for everybody, to be mm. honest, to be aware of their mental health and well-being. This mm. is quite a, a big thing for me. And it's quite a personal thing as well. But I think my, my story is quite hard hitting in places, but I, I want mm -hmm. to share it so that, mm -hmm. you know, um, people understand where it's come from and mm -hmm. how you can turn a negative into a positive. Um, yeah. You know, this goes back to, uh, you know, I was a, a, a graphic designer. I was living in Scotland. I, you know, I was married at the time. You know, my life changed when I moved to England. Um, mm -hmm. I, I basically, and he, this is a very personal story, so mm -hmm. I, I'm going to yeah. apologize for it at the start. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be, but um, so I was married and um, I went through um, seven years of domestic abuse and violence. Um, mm -hmm. So not just, it was physical, mental and, and emotional, mm -hmm. um, which really, I came out of that better than some people come out of it but it made me then deal with my mental health and well-being um mm. you know i went to various counselors i became very aware of how i deal with things how i don't deal with things how you can um get over things and how you move on um so that was a very important period in my life and it's something that i've taken through the rest of my life so when I came to um, work on bids and proposals, I loved what I was doing. Um, it was great, but the companies I worked in were small companies and I was the whole bid team. You know, I pull on salespeople and SMEs, but I was the one doing everything. And, um, you know, once you do a bid successfully, you, you, your managers tend to put more work your way so it ended up i was doing a lot and i basically had a bit of a breakdown about two years into my career um mm. and my brain just wasn't computing things properly so so again i went back to how i dealt with things before um how i would solve my own problems issues and i spent two years in the background looking at how i dealt with stress um, what were the flags that came up to show me that I was stressed? You know, how did I deal with things? Um, what coping mechanisms I could put in place? So I dealt with that. So I then continued my career, which is still stressful, but I know how to deal with it. And, and I think it's a great thing for 
people to do for themselves is to work out how they react to stress and how they can solve that and um, cope with it themselves. So um, coming back to bids and proposals, I knew Mike Fernot, who we lost, um, you know, in, in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I'd always wanted to do something to help people. I'm a very helping person. I like to help people. And when I moved to England and gone through the domestic abuse, my promise to myself was that I would use that experiences to help people. And I never did it i you know life got busy i was doing other things so when we lost mike that gave me a kick to think well wait a minute you know i i've struggled with mental health and well-being in and outside the proposal industry we've now lost mike and and you know mike was very good to me he was very supportive of me um trying to raise my profile etc that i wanted to do something for him so i thought right i need to now give to other people what I've learned about mental health and well-being. So I knew our job was very stressful and I actually went online and googled everywhere I could think of to find what was going on in our industry in regards to stress stress and mm. mental health and well-being. I never mm. found anything. I found general stuff about the general workplace but nothing about our industry, mm. our profession. Mm. So I thought well obviously nobody's done anything about it so I might as well do it so I did a survey put it out on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and everything for a proposal and bid people and um, then collated all those results I wrote a research paper and uh, a few months ago I released that white paper and um, it got good feedback. A lot of people were sending me comments saying that you know it was very relevant to them. So hopefully that that research paper has helped people. Um, it's available on SP's website if you haven't read it yet. I did promote it quite a lot. Um, I just didn't want to do it too much. So it is on SP's website if you want to read it and haven't read it. Um, but I think there's still other things we can do but that's my backstory as to why I've concentrated on the mental health and well-being. As you rightly said part of the achievement is where you are at the moment and I'm sure you know what this kind of initial hiccups made you much much stronger as a person as you are. Um, yeah I, I definitely believe that I think everything that you go through or the bad things you go through it definitely mm. can make you stronger as a person. Yes beautiful. Mary, last one. Um, your certification, Mary, you are a PMP professional. Um, how long did it take for you to achieve that? <laughs> Too long. Uh, so I started, I did um, in 2014, I did uh, foundation and practitioner. And then there's a gap of six years because I only got professional this year. Um, the reason for that, I don't know. I think people seem a bit daunted by professional. Mm. Um, and But I just never... I think for me, where I was working at the time, um, it was smaller companies, that, you know, and then Canon, it was... Practitioner was all I needed, really. Um, mm. And it wasn't until I came to work, start working with SP and actually raising my own profile that I thought... Yeah about professional and um, there's a whole thing around when you work in a company so for example when I worked at Canon I um, which I love working there but if I put anything on LinkedIn it was always about Canon it was always about uh, the print industry it was never about me and I think now I've worked at SP I've kind of changed that thinking into you should have a personal brand. You should be promoting yourself. You can promote the company you work for, but I think as bid and proposal professionals, we should be promoting ourselves and our experience and our skills as well. And it was something that I wasn't doing. I was just, I was part of Khan and I wasn't me. So once I kind of changed that thinking, I then began looking at professional. Um, <laughs> I'm not very good if I don't have a deadline, so it kind of dragged on and on. Um, and 
then I thought once we went into lockdown, I thought I, you know, I, I don't have the excuse of not having enough time anymore. So um, I, I did a lot of prep for professional. Um, it's a lot of work, and um, you know, I presented, I had to represent, but um, I passed it in the end, which was great, and it was such a relief to pass it and to know that I didn't have to do all that work. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Mary, nice. I think definitely it's hard work. I've been sitting on it for like four years now. I think, oh, no, have you not done it? Um, <laughs> no. it's, it's really worth doing, and it gives you such a great, great sense of achievement as well. Definitely. So you, sh you should go and do it. <laughs> definitely, Mary, definitely. It's up in my radar this year. Mary, let's talk a little bit more about what you already have said and also the new things, Mary. So, first one, um, your hobbies and interests, Mary. Let's talk about your hobbies and interests. Do you mind sharing some of those, Mary? Yeah. Um, these might be different to the ones I told you because I can't remember. Um, yeah, I do a lot of things. I mean, I still draw and paint. I still sell my, my artwork. Mm -hmm. um i still go to i was going to join workshops obviously can't do that now i swim or i used to swim until the, the the swimming pool closed it's opening in two weeks time so i'll be first one back in the swimming pool um swimming helps massively with my mental health and well-being but i've i've from the age of 10 i've always been in the swimming pool uh i mountain bike as well um I go to the gym. I'm very much into nutrition. I, um, I used to have a motorbike. I've had a motorbike license for 20 years. Don't have a motorbike at the moment, but um, I love watching the motorbike racing on TV. And I think the motorbike is right up my street. And I do a lot of reading as well. So um, I'm obsessed with books. <laughs> wow, that's a very wide passion, all the way from swimming, mountain biking. Oh yeah, that's those... probably not even half of it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah that's it i mean like uh going back to books first uh you yeah. have this uh hobby of collecting copies of on the road yes um, <laughs> why and and how many copies do you have um so why so on the road is a book written by jack kerouac he was one of the beat writers at the end of the 1950s in america um i came across this book when i spoke to uh a graphic designer it was an american graphic designer back in my design days and he suggested i read this book so i read it and it just gave me a sense of freedom so it was around the time where you know my marriage was breaking up and i was going to move to england and um i just got this massive sense of freedom from reading the book about you know the these people who just uh you know would travel across america and you know live on nothing and then but they'd have all these great times and you know coming from a you know being in a situation that was very restrictive and you know not always allowed to see friends not allowed to do this not allowed to do that this book just kind of opened up a whole new world to me so it's been my favorite book and the way it's written as well um you know it's continuous prose so a lot of the time there's not a lot of full stops there's not a lot of um commas and stuff but you get that sense of excitement about the whole book so i just absolutely love it so i um what happened was that i had one copy and then i suggest the book to somebody else so i give away my copy and have to buy another one and mm -hmm. it, it ended up that i ended up with quite a few copies and then um somehow i joined like a literary group on facebook and there was a a guy on there who had um, made a website that detailed all the different editions of this book and I realized that a lot of the editions had different covers lots of them were quite artistic you know and my design mind kicked in so I liked the design of these covers and stuff so I actually started collecting copies of this one book um, with a different version different editions at different covers so i probably have i don't know i've got a whole bookcase of just that one book um which 
confuses people when they come into my house. <laughs> Why <are> you just <laughs> that's the same book. Um, and I also have <laughs> copies in French, Greece, Estonian for some reason. Um, yeah, and then I've actually got a wider collection as well of other books he wrote and then he because he was a one of the beat writers i also have a wide selection of their books and poetry as well so it kind of just seemed to escalate into this huge type of book that i i read i i read heaps of other types of books as well but these are the ones that i will never um never part with and um i actually went into a second-hand bookshop when i was back home in Scotland about 10 years ago and picked up um, uh, uh, one of the books, one of the other books written by him um, for a pound. And um, I then got told that it's um, by the guy that had put up the, uh, the website of all the different covers. He actually saw a picture that I put up with this book in it. And he advised me that it's a first edition and it's worth about eight hundred pounds. So not bad for <laughs> for paying a pound for it. So yeah. My God, uh, that's a that's a community within a community, and that's super exciting. <laughs> this thing geocaching or geocaching? What Ge is that? Ge yeah. So geocaching. Um, yeah. I can't remember how I came across this. I'm sure somebody told me about it, but I, it was years ago and I can't remember how. I think it was at the point where I was spending a lot of time inside working. Um, mm. I'd be working late into the evenings, late into the night, and I wasn't getting out a lot. And I thought, well, I'm going to start walking. So I was looking up some routes to walk and stuff because I live in Buckinghamshire, so lots of fields and trees and, and places, nice places to walk. And I came across this site called Geocaching, and basically it's like a treasure hunt. So, um, and there's millions of these things hidden around the world. It's like a like a parallel kind of universe that nobody really knows about. So, um, for example, if you walk around your local park, you could actually pass these hidden things. So, a geocache is you go on the website and you can search your local area. And it's basically, it could be a little plastic box. It could be a little tiny thing as small as a screw, or it could be a big box that's like um, buried under leaves, but you can't see it if you walk past it. But on this website, you go to a map and they're all located on a map. You can click on one and it will give you a hint as to where it is. It could be hidden up a tree. It could be under a, a tree root. Um, and you've got to try and go and find it. Um, it'll take you to within 20 meters. There's an app that you can get for your phone. It'll take you to within 20 meters. And then you've got to use your skills with the, the hint and, and everything to try and find it. And then you sign a little log inside it. Um, you lo that logs on the website. And then, um, so you can do this while you're walking or while you're, you know, if you're taking your kids out for a walk or you want something to do with your kids, a lot of kids like it. Um, and sometimes in these little boxes, you can find little trinkets that you can pass on to, you can take to the next one you find. So they travel around. Um, I have a couple of these things that I set free in these little boxes. And one of them has done about 40,000 miles. It's currently in California, I think. So you can track things that you've set free, like this little travel bug thing. Um, yeah, so I can bring up a map on the website, on the geocache website, and see all the ones that I found. And, um, you know, it, it's, I like graphs and tables and things that you can see that you've done. So this is great for me. But it's a really good idea if you want to do something while you're out walking, or if you want to get your kids out walking and they don't really want to, this is a little bit of excitement for them. So, yeah, it's like a, a big treasure hunt that is hidden from the normal world, really. Yes, that's <laughs> amazing. I, I've never heard of this. I'm sure many of the listeners will be, one, by the moment you drop that word, they will be Googling and they'll be understanding what's happening around them. <laughs> Let's yeah. leave it to them to find <laughs> the local fun. one. Definitely. So uh, do you listen to music as well, Myri? Yes, I'm a huge music fan. 
Um, I've got quite a story around that as well. Um, when I was growing up, my uncle, so my mum's brother, he um, was extremely well into music. So um, he wasn't married, had no kids. So he he made it his mission in life to get all his nieces and nephews interested in proper music. And, mm. you know, so very much from like the punk era, like the the early 80s, the kind of new romantics, the independent type stuff. Um, John Peel, who was a DJ on Radio 1, all the music that he played my uncle was into. So me and my cousins, all of the same type of musical taste, mm. um, all brought together by my uncle. Um, and he always used to go to gigs. He was always going to see these obscure little bands and stuff. So that's where I got my music taste from. Um, unfortunately, he died at the end of last year. Mm. And um, so my intention for 2021 to mm. kind of celebrate my, my uncle, and I don't know if it's going to work because we still mm. can't go to music gigs, was to have a year of going to all the gigs that I wanted to go and see. So. Um, I've started, I have bought a few tickets to gigs, but they keep getting moved. <laughs> so uh, it might be 2022 before I do that. But um, yeah, I love going to gigs. I'm very much into early 80s music, um, late 70s with a whole kind of punk generation thing. Um, and also I'm into this type of music. It's quite a small group. Uh, genre I suppose um, called synth wave so mm -hmm. it, it's modern but it's all about the 80s so if you've ever watched uh, Stranger Things on Netflix it's that type of vibe and there's a lot of synthesizer in it there's lots of saxophone but it does it takes you right back to like when you were a teenager in the 80s type thing and there's two main groups one is called The Midnight and one is called FM 84 so if you've never listened to them, go and listen to them. I think they're fantastic. I've flown especially to New York to um, go and see these groups in concert. And because it's quite a small genre, um, their gigs are still pretty small. So when I, the first gig I went to of theirs was their first proper gig. And that was in Brooklyn in New York about three years ago. And um, both bands played together to about 300 people. Uh, so now they're at the stage where they play to about a thousand people. So they are getting bigger and, and more recognised. But um, I'm very much into that type of music at the moment. Wow. Another, another very niche passion of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm so not musical. Can't sing, can't play an instrument, can't read music, nothing. But music is quite a big part of my life. So, yeah. Perfect. So... Uh... What movie can you watch over again oh. and I, again without ever getting tired of? Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> Jaws really? is my absolute favorite movie. I love watching any shark movie, um, but Jaws is my absolute favorite. Um, I was very young when it came out. So, you know, I'd never seen it in the cinema. I just seen it, you know, um, on video on, on dvd or when it comes on tv but i will watch it every time and the the weird thing is that i can read a book and remember 85 percent of the book straight off mm -hmm. i watch a film and as soon as it finishes i really can't remember the detail so when i watch jaws <laughs> there's a there's a specific part where there's two divers underwater they're diving around this ship and this dead body floats out of the porthole, which Jaws is obviously attacked. And it gets me every single time. I jump every single time because I never remember it. And uh, all my friends laugh at me when, when that happens. <laughs> but, um, but I've seen Jaws a very, very huge amount of times. And then last year, they put it on in my local cinema. So I went mm. to see it. And that was the first time I'd seen it in the cinema. But the, mm. another weird thing is that although I read heaps and heaps of books, I've never read the Jaws book. So okay. that's my next book to read is Jaws. But yeah, I think I'll be watching Jaws for the next 
20 years probably. <laughs> <laughs> 100%, 100%. And uh, what's one personal trait you really like the most about yourself? Oh my goodness. I'm really bad with this kind of stuff. Um, I'm just not the type of person that ever, you know, you, you know, you get people that are very outspoken about their good points. Um, full of themselves sometimes which I really don't like that I, I'm quite a, I'm quite I've got quite a quiet soul and I don't tend to you know in general you know work wise it's different but in general as a person I don't tend to kind of promote you know much about me um I'm I'm full of empathy I probably have too much empathy but mm. I'm I I seem to pick up on other people's feelings very quickly so mm. i can usually tell when somebody's struggling with something or something's troubling them um and um i tend to pick up on that really quick i have a lot of empathy for people because i've been through a lot in my life and most situations i've been through and come out the other side so i'm very understanding as well um and, and very open so I think by being open, you can help other people that maybe they're going through something that they don't actually want to talk about, but by me being open, it might help them without them actually having to, you know, tell me what's going on. So, yes, that's great. In the end, you did manage to come up with your strong point, yeah. Mary, which is good. <laughs> that's so typical of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's super good. So uh, who haven't you seen or talked to in a long time and you hope that they're doing okay? Oh, there's so many people. I've become a bit of a hermit. Obviously, we're locked down. Mm. Um, and I'm not, I know the pubs and restaurants are open at the moment, but I'm really just avoiding all that. But I would probably say my family. Mm. Um, so I live down just outside London, all my family live in the northeast of Scotland. So I miss them and I haven't been back for quite a long time. Um, mm. it, it just time things and stuff. So yeah, my mum and my stepdad and my, my dad and all my brothers and my youngest brother has just had a baby. Mm. So um, I need to go and see it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I would say I, I miss my family and, you know, they're the ones that I haven't seen for, you know, it's been too long. Got you. So if you could only eat three food for the rest of your life, <laughs> which three food would you choose? Oh my goodness. Uh, three food. Oh, I love food. Uh, cheese. It would have to be cheese. Mm -hmm. Um... Brussels sprouts. That's interesting. I know. And you know what? I Since lockdown, I've not been able to find Brussels sprouts in any supermarket. Mm. So um, so that's probably why it's become one of my three choices. Brussels sprouts, cheese, uh, chocolate. Would have to be chocolate, which is a bad choice. But, um, that's it. I think that's yeah. a well-balanced diet there. <laughs> so... Uh, this drawing, um, drawing nude people and life model and stuff. Uh, when you went there for the very first time, um, because even now, you know, it's it's uh, because one of my friend does that as well, Myri. But you know, we're coming from a pretty orthodox uh, thingy back from South India. You know, I, I mm -hmm. I'm I'm even shy to talk about these things. But it <laughs> took me a while when my friend introduced me to that sort of places and stuff, which was quite fascinating, you know? So when, what opened you to that genre of drawing? And when you draw for the very first time, how was that experience? <laughs> um, so it's something that I've done since college days. So um, mm. studying art, you, you do, you know, you don't just paint. So uh, we'd go out and paint outside. We'd draw outside. We'd go to different locations and do architectural drawings. We'd do photography. We'd do kind of 
design work and uh one of the things was uh you know drawing the human form um and i'm fascinated with humans in general because everybody is different everybody thinks differently everybody looks differently everybody's got different opinions and it just fascinates me and i'm a big photographer as well and i've always liked um photographing people um i do a lot of architectural photography recently but um my first love is always people and how different they are so while i was at college that's when we did draw in the human form you you did have a proper human it wasn't you know draw a skeleton with you know put skin on it type thing it was you had a, a person there that was naked so you can see you know how the kind of bones fit together how the bone structure is on the face how the spine carves how the light hits different parts of the body um so i'm very much into the 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 shapes that light makes on the body. My photography is all about kind of shapes, which is where the architecture comes in. But um, I love looking at shapes and how the human body is formed and how delicate it can be and how beautiful the carves and the, you know, just, I just love all that. So, um, so I did that at college and then there was a good few years after that where um, there was just nowhere to do that type of drawing unless you could get somebody to pose for you which you know mm -hmm. i just never even asked anybody um so when i moved to england uh there's a few places around here that did workshops so basically uh the workshops i went to you would it would be from like 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon so you would come in there'd be a model that you know was getting paid for doing this and they'd mm -hmm. be in the middle of the room all the people that were drawn would be in a circle and they, they just do different poses so at the beginning of a session you would uh do really quick drawings so maybe like just a minute long um and you do quite a few of them it's, it's just to loosen your arm up so that you can do kind of bigger grander shapes rather than just tiny little drawings um mm. and then you go into longer poses so that the poses would end up sometimes you'd have an hour to do a pose so you could actually paint them or you could do one drawing and then move around the room and do it from a different position um you know so very very interesting um obviously i'm doing it you know everybody there is doing it for you know because they want to um draw the human form there's no like weirdness about it um, obviously it's a closed workshop so you can't get people just walking in off the street um, but yeah the first time I went uh, it'd been quite a few years since I'd done it and, and you do tend to know the people that are there for the first time because they avoid looking at certain parts of the body or you know <laughs> and at the end of each kind of drawing we would share our drawings in the middle of the room so that you could um, the tutor would go around and kind of give you feedback and you can see what everybody else was doing so you could get ideas and stuff and you you always knew the people that were new because there would be great parts of the, of the body missing and things but you get used to it it's, you know we're all human you know and and it's it's not something to be ashamed of you know the human body's a beautiful thing so yeah so i i tend to use charcoals and um charcoal in uh colored chalks and do big like um a1 size drawings and i've sold quite a few of my artworks that i've done of those so got you have has it happened anywhere like you just finished the drawing and then you showed that to the lady or anybody and said oh that doesn't look like me or that exactly looks like me <laughs> have you had any funny experiences um, like that no no i do tend to get a good likeness um i love doing portraits of people um and capturing their likeness so i'm i'm yeah i haven't had any situations where people say oh no that doesn't look like me <laughs> so. god yeah god yeah i'm not sure about the nude painting there uh, um <laughs> but you know, if if you are willing to do the normal one i'm there next time <laughs> <laughs> no let's do that who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Um, in my career, I think there's two main people. Um, one that I've talked about already, so John Williams. 
definitely mm. up there. Um, as soon as I met John, I could see his passion for what he did. Um, and and that's, uh, that's something that attracts me to people, is seeing people have passion for what they do, whether it's inside of work, outside of work. You know, I think so many people go through life just surviving and not living their life. Mm -hmm. um, to, so to see somebody with, that's got passion just attracts me instantly. Um, he, he's always been around, before I worked for SP, he's always been around if I've needed to like phone him up or, or have a chat. We haven't had that many chats or, or phone calls before I joined SP, but I knew he was always there. And just, uh, he just, just by the way he was passionate, just inspired the passion in me to drive myself further. Um, and then since I've joined SP, he's been so helpful and supportive. You know, he's, he's now, we're now colleagues. He's always helpful, always supportive. He's, um, I suffer a bit with, you know, um, not believing in myself all the time. And I can see that he totally has every faith in me. So that's encouraged me to believe that as well. And um, yeah, he's just, he's just great around people. And I just aspire to be more like him really so he's been a massive influence in my career and just how you are as a person around people another person um is matthew norton now he was my first boss at canon um he interviewed me at a lengthy interview process it took a whole day and it's do a million different things but um he employed me so he was my first boss there and he is the best boss i've ever had he is so positive He's moved on from Canon now, but he was so positive, um, very encouraging, encouraged me to go and get my qualifications, always had my back. Um, if, a, if a bid went wrong or a proposal went wrong or something wasn't right in it, we would have a chat afterwards, but he would always make it positive. He'd always take out, take the positives out of it so that you didn't lose confidence, so that you didn't feel like you weren't doing a good job. And that just made his team stronger. Um, and I think it's a fantastic way to, to be a boss and lead your team and lead individuals. So he had a massive impact on my confidence in what I did and, um, you know, still still does. So, um, so work-wise, that there's people that have been most influential. Um, outside of work, I would have to say my mum. Um, me and my mum aren't particularly close. Uh, we tend to rub each other up the wrong way quite a lot. Um, we're very independent, but I have gained a lot from her. Um, so my mum and dad got divorced when I was about 10 and my mum became a single mum to two kids. Um, and just the way she brought us up um, and just watching her and what she did really encouraged me to be independent. She uh, would wallpaper the walls. She would, you know, she had to do all the DIY. She had to dig the garden up to make a vegetable patch. She would, you know, so she became very independent and I learned that from her. And I'm a very independent person. Um, so, you know, I've traveled around the world on my own. I've, um, I've knocked down walls in the house that I used to live in in Scotland. I've I can plaster a wall, I can lay a carpet, I can wallpaper, <laughs> I can do DIY. So most things that, you know, you might think, oh, I need, need to get a male to do that. I would just do it myself. So um, she's taught me to be very independent, probably too independent. But, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for my mum and how she brought us up and um, been very influential as to how I've turned out as an adult. <laughs> Definitely, Mighty, definitely. So what have you observed lately in this COVID environment that reminded you that people are kind and good? Um, so during lockdown, I think right at the beginning, I really liked seeing the whole local community, mm. you know, local communities across the whole country come together to help people who were vulnerable people or people that had to isolate and couldn't get out to you know they couldn't go and pick up a prescription they couldn't go and, and collect their food from the shop um you know seeing all these 
community groups pop up um, in the local area and how many people wanted to help other people was yep. um, I found that pretty amazing um, and that you know most people are good out there um, just people coming together I've had people check up on me you know people know me that I kind of isolated on my own um, you know I'm not around family because they're 600 miles away um, so people would check up on me and, and even knowing that sometimes I struggle with my mental health and they're making sure I was okay just a phone call here and there just made massive amount of difference to me so um, it's been great to see everybody pull together you know um, I know there's been a lot of negatives going around about people doing things they shouldn't be doing and all this you know but I think it's brought out the best in people What's one kind or thoughtful thing someone did to you in the past year? Oh my goodness. Oh, you know. <laughs> so um, in January, SP get together. So they get together twice a year. Um, and we usually get together in a January time. Um, just to kind of come together and look at what's happening in the next year, the direction we're going in, that type of thing. And, and we just have this kind of, we call it a retreat and we stay overnight. So it was usually two days. Um, so when I went there, I was actually having, I was going through a really hard time. I just lost my uncle who's, who's a, a big part of my life. And um, I was struggling with some other things, just mental health in general. I tend to go really quiet and not talk to people, which is the opposite of what I tell everybody else to do. Um, and so I went to this retreat and it was, it was around about my birthday. I don't really tell people it's my birthday. Um, and uh, one of the designers at SP, Rachel, she just mm -hmm. came up to me and she was like, oh, hi, how are you? Hope you, you know, asked how I was. And then she gave me a box of chocolates for my birthday. And it just mm -hmm. meant the world. I mean, it was such a simple thing, but it was, she remembered from me telling her at some point, it, it, was round about my birthday and she knew I was going through a hard time and, and that box of chocolates just meant everything at that time so um so yeah it would have to be Rachel <laughs> that's nice so if, if you could visit any place in the world where would you choose to go and why oh no this is so I think probably obvious to everybody um I would go to New York so when I worked at Canon, I actually spent a year living in New York, working in the bid team at Canon in Manhattan. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And I've made so many friends there um, that I continue to go back there. And I know there's a million places in the world and I love other places. Like when I traveled the world, I went to Tokyo, New Zealand, um, you know, I've been to Kuwait and South Africa and various other places. but yeah i think new york for me um and you know because my friends are there um and um and also i support the new york rangers ice hockey team <laughs> so <laughs> i'm a bit obsessed with ice hockey on that team so i tend to go back out there and go watch some hockey and catch up with friends so it's the first place that i go back to perfect so what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? I think there's a few things. One is, um, which I've talked about already, is develop your own personal brand. So don't just promote the company you work for, promote yourself as well, because you are a brand in your own right, you know. And, and I think that kind of also encourages you to then do things like your certifications and 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 um branch out and just you know do things like join the APMP board or be a volunteer or you know get involved in different initiatives so you're focusing on yourself as well as the company you work for so that's one thing I think um, and also a massive thing just in life in general is believe in yourself and, and be be yourself don't be something that you're not to try and um, please somebody else just believe in yourself be who you are um, be that, you know, be open, be honest and, and let people see who you are and, um, and the good stuff will shine through. 
and um, yeah, and that should get you ahead in your career um, and just build up relationships with people, which is especially um, good when you're working with SMEs. If you do something for them, they'll help you out. So that's helped me throughout my whole career. That's nice. What is the best piece of advice you have received and from whom? I think I think that's it, which I've just covered, the, the believe in yourself and just mm. be you because you are good enough. Mm. Um, and that's something I've struggled with. I think with the, everything I've gone through in life, I sometimes think I'm not good enough. And obviously I, I have that whole imposter syndrome, which I think mm. a lot of other bid and proposal people suffer from. Um, and, and it is just, just believe in yourself. You are good enough. Um, and that's come from quite a lot of people <laughs> that have said that to me. So. Hundred percent, my I think you know you uh, you need to believe now so that people will believe later, right? Yes, it exactly. all starts from you. Starts yeah. from you. That's a beautiful point. Um, so, Mary, you know, successful bidding career, you know, swimmer, mountain biker, photographer, painter, drawer, book reader, and so many other things. Traveler, you know, geo caching, if I get that word correctly, yeah. and uh, so many other things, Mary. What's next for you? What are you looking forward to in the future? um so more of the same um so i want to continue doing all that uh, um, i want to keep up all the things that i've now uh done during lockdown so i walk every day now uh helps right. massively with well-being and and just nice to get out um so i'm going to continue doing stuff like that um work-wise and career-wise i'm very happy at strategic proposals so more of that um and more apmp board stuff i love being on the board i've still got a lot of work to do um and there's lots of ways we can make it better so looking forward to more of that um and then also another big thing for me is still looking at the mental health and well-being within the profession so i came out with a research paper and there's various results that have come out with that so one of the things was that um when when people in the bid and proposal profession have reached out to management for help because they're not coping or they need support 57 percent of those who went to management for help um received very neg negative feedback so that's the thing i really want to look at is how do we change that so you know we've got the bid community now through apmp there's a well-being place on there i'm still trying to make sure that it's at the forefront of everybody's minds by posting things on linkedin by talking to people but i think the the issue now is how do we get management involved so that they can learn how to deal with their team how to support their team how to understand their team when they're overstretched when they've got these like really tight deadlines and they don't have enough staff that they're working until three o'clock in the morning how do we get management to understand how it is to be a member of the team and what support they need and how to get that support so um you know if md's got any ideas um i'm quite happy to hear them um and you know i want to bring that forward so that we can solve that issue going forward as well and just make our profession a better one to be in that's not so stressful and not um and if it is stressful at least we have positive places we can go and positive management as well that can support us well said Mary. well said i think that's super powerful other than this Mary, is there anything else you would like to share or is there anything that we missed that you want to cover um i think we've covered everything I would uh, I would just um, I think as my part in shot I would just say to everybody to um, you know develop yourself within the profession um, there's a lot of different initiatives on at the moment lots of exciting stuff coming up especially with APMP get yourself on the bid community and start sharing and getting your name known um, you know I found that my career's progressed as I've got my name known you get to know other people they get to know about you and opportunities open up so that the thing that I would say to everybody is and be proud of, of the job that you do um, and reach out for help if you do struggle there's plenty places to get support and you know 
I'm happy to help as well. well of course you will, Mary. <laughs> Everybody knows you. <laughs> and you will always be there with people. So Mary, that's it. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining uh, uh, Scribble Talk. So it's been a real privilege to have you with us here. Wish you and your speaker colleagues and everybody around your APMP and your family, friends, all the good health and happiness. Please thank continue you. to inspire bid and proposal industry colleagues around you and stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy and keep inspiring. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchuscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pasca Syndrome. Signing off.